Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. When you are young, you make mistakes of the heart. But once you get to a certain age, you start to wear your mistakes. And if you make enough bad choices, they begin to define you. Lance Herndon was in the prime of his life. He was ambitious and tirelessly driven. He was a successful black businessman in Atlanta in the 1990s, a dynamic time in the city that's too busy to hate. Lance was part of an elite social group. He wasn't Atlanta old money. He was one of the energetic, hardworking nouveau riche in the city. His image was everything to him. He worked hard to make the right connections. By 1996, Lance had three divorces under his belt. These failed marriages didn't necessarily stain his image, though. His continued womanizing was an open secret. But when he was found murdered, he was lauded and remembered as not just a successful young black man, but as a generous role model for the black community. Lance Herndon, the award-winning entrepreneur, was mourned by powerful people. People who wanted his case solved. But the investigation uncovered a messy personal life, counter to the image of Lance in the press. His two fatal flaws were money and women. As Ludacris sang, Welcome to Atlanta, where the players play. Welcome to episode 148, The Murder of Lance Herndon. I've done a few episodes with cases from Atlanta, so I won't go too far into Atlanta history. What I will discuss is Atlanta in the 1990s. That ubiquitous phrase, that Atlanta is a city too busy to hate, has been around for over 50 years, but really became a cultural touchstone in the 90s. That's a catchphrase Atlanta earned for being such a progressive big city in the Deep South and for being a mecca for black people. There has been a black mayor in office in Atlanta since 1974, and yet plenty of black and white folks will point out that the infamous slogan is a political mask on a city still dealing with all kinds of racial disparity. But the 90s was a bit of a golden era for black Atlantans. Freaknik came to town, originally a festival known as a spring break for historically black colleges. But it blew up and became a national phenomenon, and then the city didn't know how to handle it. Businesses were angry at the disruption by the ever-growing street party. Hotels started refusing reservations. Without any real cooperation with city leadership, it soon imploded. Some say the policing of the April 1996 Freaknik would be a dry run for the Olympics that summer. But for the beginning of that unique time in Atlanta history, Black people moved there in droves. And they began to feel their voices heard. When Outkast, an Atlanta-based hip-hop duo, won a 1995 Source Award for Best New Rap Artist, the audience booed and heckled. Andre 3000 answered them with, The South has got something to say. It was new to some, but for others, the black upper class in Atlanta was just a way of life. It's home to some of the oldest and most successful black-owned businesses in the nation. Atlanta also has the largest black academic community, thanks to the Atlanta University Center, a consortium of six historically black colleges. Some of the old guard black elite come from the academic community. But the first black millionaire in Atlanta was a former enslaved man who opened his own barber shop and then life insurance company. Today, Atlanta Life is the nation's largest black-owned insurance company. That man's name was Alonzo Herndon. No relation, as far as I can tell, to the victim in today's story, Lance Herndon. And ironically, both men were considered nouveau riche, or new money, in their time. But they were self-made men who made great achievements without any connections. In the early 90s, 
Lance Herndon had become a success, and he had worked damn hard to get there. He didn't take it for granted either, and made sure to give back to his community. But he was also very much into the renaissance of black culture happening in the 1990s. Legendary rapper, songwriter, and producer Jermaine Dupri called Freaknik the birth of flexing. And it was true. Flaunting your money and status was everything. And Lance Herndon was no different. Dubbed The Black Jay Gatsby by author Ron Stodgehill, Lance did embody that unique 90s spirit. He flexed. This self-made man was not ashamed of celebrating his success. He loved the power, and he also loved women. And he trusted those women with so much of his life and his money. In August of 1996, when Lance didn't show up for work at the home office in his mansion, his longtime employee, Zanya, didn't go upstairs and check on him. Lance may have built a home office for convenience, but he kept strict rules about his privacy. So she called his mother. Jackie Herndon walked in on a scene no mother should have to see. Her son, laying naked in his bed, was so brutally beaten in the head that he was unrecognizable. The image would haunt her for the rest of her life. Born in April of 1955, Lance Harrison Herndon was the only child of working-class parents. His mother, Jackie, worked as a clerk for J.C. Penney's, while his father, Russell, worked odd jobs in between hanging out at the bar with his friends. As a young boy, Lance's father left, forcing Jackie to raise her son alone. But being a single mother meant she had to work constantly to make ends meet, which meant Lance was often home alone. So Jackie let seven-year-old Lance move in with his paternal grandparents, who lived on a farm in rural Virginia. Lance's grandfather, John Harrison, taught Lance how to work on a farm, raise and sell livestock, and more. Essentially, this is where Lance learned how to run a business, how to work hard from sunup to sundown. He greatly admired his grandfather's work ethic and considered him to be a father figure. Lance spent six years living at the farm before moving back to New York to be with his mother. After high school, Lance graduated with a degree in computer science from City College of New York. He went on to complete a master's degree in computer science from the City University of New York. Seeing the success other young black people were finding in Atlanta, Lance decided that was the place he needed to be, so he moved from one black mecca to another. In 1980, Lance founded Access Inc., a computer consulting firm. He may not have known it at the time, but by creating Access, Lance opened the doors for black people to join him in the tech field. He was revolutionary, an astute businessman, and an excellent role model for young black kids. By the mid-90s, the company was the largest black-owned computer consulting firm in the Southeast. They had annual sales of $3 million, around $5 million today, and 47 employees. The company's clients included the City of Atlanta, the Atlanta Committee for the Olympic Games, Coca-Cola, and the Fulton County government. Because Lance was such a game-changer and inspiration, he received many awards, including Outstanding Business Achievement, Atlanta's Business League's Entrepreneur of the Year, Minority Small Business Person of the Year Award, and he was a finalist for Georgia's Entrepreneur of the Year. Lance was also recognized nationally by two presidents, George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton, who made Lance a presidential appointee to the White House Conference on Small Businesses. Friends described Lance as being giving, loyal, dedicated, unselfish, thoughtful, caring, sensitive, dependable, and just plain good people. Atlanta Mayor Bill Campbell said Lance was a dear friend and a pillar in the community. He had my utmost respect for his warmth, professionalism, and dedication to Atlanta. His success was never personal. He shared it with the community. Friends added that Lance always wanted people to experience things with him. 
Like when he was invited to ride on a nuclear submarine, he invited his friend Bill Campbell along. A former vice president of Delta Airlines said Lance always wanted to help the other guy who was not as fortunate as himself. You can say he was tough-minded and tender-hearted. Lance donated his time and his money to organizations like the United Negro College Fund, the NAACP, and the Atlanta Business League. And he didn't stop there. He also frequently spent time with young kids, taking them on outings to a museum or even to Six Flags. He wanted to make sure that children had every opportunity to advance themselves. Lance also took care of the people in his neighborhood. His 16-year-old neighbor, Lindsay, later said that he always gave her summer jobs and never once missed a dance recital. He was a father figure to her, just like his grandfather had been to him. In his free time, Lance loved cars, racquetball, and traveling. During a 1989 trip to Brazil, Lance, who had briefly been married twice before, met a young corporate flight attendant named Janine. They were both standing under the Christ Redeemer statue in Rio de Janeiro when they spotted each other. Janine thought Lance was cute, so she walked up to him and said hi. Months later, they were married. Within a year of their wedding, Lance and Janine welcomed a son they named John Harrison for Lance's beloved grandfather. Harrison later told Oxygen that he remembers Lance as a great dad. They spent a lot of time together. There are so many photos of the loving father and son on a jungle gym and a helicopter cuddling on the couch, you name it. The Herndons moved to the exclusive North Cliff subdivision of Roswell, which is around 20 miles north of downtown Atlanta. The Atlanta Constitution described North Cliff as being, quote, a quiet neighborhood of large, expensive homes where lawns bordering long driveways are highly landscaped and neatly carefully manicured. Access to the subdivision is controlled by a guard at the entrance. The Herndon's 6,000-square-foot colonial was surrounded by beautiful trees, shrubbery, and a white marble lattice, which ensured privacy. There were four bedrooms, three-and-a-half baths, a large entertainment area, and an attached garage. The bottom level was turned into Access Inc. office space, where Lance and a handful of employees could work. Lance seemingly had it all, but as is often the case, with lots of money comes lots of women. And Lance liked women. A lot. He had so many affairs that Janine decided to file for divorce in January 1996. She loved him but she couldn't take the hurt any longer. Following their divorce, Lance and Janine maintained a friendship. He continued living in the North Cliff house, but he paid for most of Janine and Harrison's living expenses and continued seeing Harrison regularly. It was so important to Lance that he spent time with his son that he put playdates on his official office calendar and told his employees to make sure he was available for the dates. Not long after Lance and Janine's divorce, 40-year-old Lance went to the MARTA Public Transportation Office on business. There, he met a 28-year-old employee by the name of Dion Bowe. Born in August of 1967 in Jamaica, Dion grew up in a working-class family. By the time she was 20, she immigrated to the States, like many of her extended family members had done in the past. In the spring of 1988, Dion, who later became a naturalized citizen, was living in Miami, going to community college, and working as a bank secretary. One night, she went out dancing at a nightclub, where she met Sean Nelson, a man from a prominent Jamaican family, living in Miami while studying for his pilot's license. Things quickly became serious between Dion and Sean, and in May 1990, they married. Two years later, they welcomed a daughter, Amanda. When it came time for Sean to continue his pilot's training, the family moved to Atlanta. Dion continued taking college classes there and soon took a job as an executive secretary at MARTA. After the move to Atlanta, Dion's behavior changed. Sean later said Dion had no tolerance for her daughter Amanda. She would not sit down and reason with a little girl or try to figure out what was going on with her. Instead, she would get angry, 
and often hit the child. Not that it's an excuse, but she was alone with her daughter much of the time because Sean was so often out of the country on training to become a pilot. But that also left Dion with ample time to see other men, wealthy men who lavished her with gifts. One of Dion's co-workers, Patricia, told Ron Stodgill, author of Redbone, that Dion's starting salary was only $21,000, yet she was dressed to the nines every day, from head to toe. She was sharp as a tack, like a thousand dollars worth of clothes every day, and she never wore anything twice. Whenever anyone in the Marta office asked Dion how she could afford such nice things on her salary, she would just smile. Although later, she would talk about how she could get men to do anything she wanted them to do, because she knew what to do and how to work it. Dion would even brag about having the men at Marta wrapped around her finger. And Patricia said she wasn't lying. The male employees would do anything and everything for her. And while Dion was a good employee who showed up for work every day, met her deadlines, and did whatever she was asked to do, she was also very malicious. Patricia told Stodgill that when she was going through a divorce, Dion started a rumor that Patricia was missing a lot of work because her husband was gay and had contracted AIDS. Patricia was very hurt by this rumor because not only was it false, she loved her husband dearly and did not actually want the divorce, but his struggles with addiction had become too much for her, which obviously was a very private matter. Patricia confronted Dion, but she denied starting the rumor. Patricia was so upset by the whole situation that she actually ended up quitting. Later, all but one person in the office quit because of Dion. Of course, Lance Herndon had no way of knowing Dion Bowe's true nature when he met her in early 1996. But he would immediately get a taste of her manipulation tactics. After Lance left the Marta office that day, Dion's boss told her that Lance was a wealthy mover and shaker who was going to have a fancy, invitation-only 41st birthday party in April. Dion called Lance's office and spoke directly to Lance about the party. After getting off the phone, Lance told his assistant, Zanya that he had this young lady who is from Marta who is trying to trick me. She says her boss didn't receive the invitation. Zanya and Lance laughed about it, but Lance still had Zanya fax Dion a copy of the invitation. On April 12th, Lance's 41st party was held at Another World, a circular, glass-enclosed nightclub located on the roof of the Atlanta Hilton. As I told you, author Ron Stodgill described Lance as being a kind of black Jay Gatsby. His parties were always elaborate, over-the-top, with way too much money spent. Lance's 41st birthday was no different. The dance floor was lined with tables holding mounds of golf shrimp and exotic cheeses, ornate pastries and lavish chocolates, and bottle upon bottle of wine and champagne. There were 400 guests at the party, but Lance focused his attention on Dion, who he was immediately smitten with. She had him wrapped around her pretty little finger. Just like Dion's previous Atlanta boyfriends, Lance lavished her with cash and gifts, and even lent her a credit card. Dion didn't mention that she was married and Lance didn't mention that he had numerous other girlfriends. Not long after Dion and Lance started dating, Dion's husband, Sean, came home for a visit, and she surprised him with a new $189,000 home she had purchased herself. Knowing how little money Dion made at Marta, Sean didn't understand how she could afford the house. Dion told him she had saved up for it, but that did not explain why she had never mentioned buying a house to Sean. It's unclear how she got enough money to purchase the house, or if Lance or any other boyfriend bought it for her. Whoever did was very generous. Another time Sean flew back home, Dion picked him up in a shiny new Mercedes Benz. When he asked where she had gotten the car, Dion told him that her new mentor, Lance Herndon, signed a lease for her since her credit was too poor to get it on her own. You know, even though she had bought that whole house by herself. Sean didn't believe Dion. 
He'd had a feeling she had been unfaithful for a while, but this was just blatant. He suggested that they spend time apart to figure out what she wanted. Dion agreed, and Sean and Amanda went back to Jamaica, where he soon earned his pilot's license. Meanwhile, Lance was coming to the realization that he was actually broke. It was a difficult pill to swallow for a man of his achievements. For the last 16 years, Axis had been making a lot of money, but Lance spent too much money. And when business decreased, Lance did not adjust his spending habits. By the time he started dating Dion, he was in debt 75000 to credit card companies and 50000 to contractors. That's not including at least four luxury car payments, his mortgage, or the mortgages for three rentals, only one of which was occupied. Lance always made sure his Axis employees were paid on time and his ex-wife and son were taken care of. But no one in his life knew Lance was making sacrifices to make it happen. He had to let some of his personal home staff go, like the woman who cooked meals for him. He also started doing his own laundry and things of that nature to save money. And let's face it, if your average person suddenly became rich like Lance, there is a high probability that they too would overspend and not realize their mistake until it's too late. We've seen this time and again with celebrities and famous athletes. It's very easy to do. As for Lance's personal life, for the first few months of their relationship, he really seemed to genuinely be into Dion. But as time went on, he found her to be pushy. Then in July 1996, something happened that made Lance think Dion was a little more than pushy. He thought she was crazy. On July 10th, 1996, Dion showed up at Lance's house unannounced. She peeked into his windows and saw that Lance was with another woman, and the woman was naked. Dion banged on Lance's door and caused a scene, refusing to leave. Lance called the police, who told Dion to leave. If she came back, she would be arrested. Dion left, but returned a few hours later. Lance called the police again, and Dion was arrested for criminal trespassing. The next day, Lance bailed Dion out and asked police to drop the charges, though the cops declined to drop the charges. They had given her one warning pass, one that would not probably be given to a man in that situation. So the second call stuck. Many people have questioned why Lance would bail her out after trespassing. Lance's assistant, Zanya, said maybe Lance thought he drove her to that point and felt guilty. Although he bailed her out, the trespassing incident was the breaking point for Lance. He wanted to end their relationship. He decided he would do it after their court date, which was set for August 8th. In the meantime, he started distancing himself from Dion and cut her off from his credit cards. He planned on getting the Mercedes back as well. With Lance out of the picture, Dion turned back to her family. On August 4th, Sean and Amanda came to visit. Everything was going well until the evening of August 6th when the phone rang as Sean and Dion were lying in bed. Sean picked up, and it was Lance, asking to speak to Dion. After going back and forth a few times, Sean reluctantly handed the phone over to Dion, who hung up instead of answering. But it didn't matter. Sean was very upset, and was now more certain than ever that Dion was cheating. He spent the night on the couch, then spent the next day packing up his and Amanda's things. At around 8.30 p.m. on August 7th, Dion dropped Amanda and Sean off at the airport. Within 20 minutes, she was on the phone with Lance, trying to make plans to meet at his place that night. They had court the next day, and Dion wanted to iron a few details out. Her walls were closing in. She knew Lance wanted out of their relationship, and now Sean, who had always put up with so much of her bullshit, was finally leaving her. When Lance's staff arrived for work the next morning at 8 a.m., he was nowhere to be found. His assistant, Zanya, was surprised. She had spoken with him the day before and knew he was supposed to be in the office that morning. They had gone over his schedule the day before, and while he did not have any meetings, 
he would not be going to court for the criminal trespassing charge to speak up for Dion. She was on her own. Lance had never been late before. He had a strict schedule. Like his grandpa, he was up way before the sun. He used three alarms to wake up at 4 a.m. every workday and was always in his office by 5 a.m. Zanya started paging Lance, but received no answer. Knowing that she was not allowed to venture outside of the home office, she called Lance's mother, Jackie, who lived a few blocks away, to come over and see if Lance was still in bed. Shortly after 10 a.m., Jackie went into Lance's bedroom to see if he was still sleeping. On his waterbed, Jackie saw that the covers were messed up and pulled all the way up to the head of the bed. When Jackie pulled the covers back, she saw blood everywhere and 41-year-old Lance's nude body with his arms crossed over his chest. Sobbing, Jackie called 911 and told the dispatcher that she had found her son with his head bashed in. When investigators showed up, they noticed there were no signs of forced entry. Walking through the garage, investigators found silver chewing gum wrappers, so many that it was unusual, especially considering the fact that Lance wasn't a gum chewer and his house was always immaculately clean. Investigators made their way into the bedroom. The headboard and wall above were splattered with blood. The bedding was soaked and a pillowcase was missing. Lance's body was lying on the waterbed under the covers. He had been hit on the crown of his head with a single, non-fatal blow, which probably disoriented him or knocked him unconscious. Lance then most likely fell back onto the bed, where the killer then climbed on top and straddled him as they delivered multiple blows, as few as 11 or as many as 14, to the front and right side of his face. These blows crushed all of the facial bones inward and caused his death. It was unclear what weapon was used to cause the blows. Whatever it was had not been left behind at the scene. There were no defensive wounds and little blood below Lance's waist, which only bolstered the theory that the killer was straddling Lance while killing him. Either way, it was clear that whoever did this was out of control. Investigators looked the room over for clues. The television was off and the VCR was on, though not playing anything. Inside the VCR was a porn tape. Next to the bed, there was another porn tape and a face-down picture of a beautiful woman wearing a negligee. Lance's three alarm clocks had been unplugged. One was frozen at 4.10 a.m. The missing pillowcase was found in the toilet. The killer had used it to wipe off. The killer had also washed off in the shower before leaving. One of the most interesting things investigators found in Lance's room was his belt, coins, and pager scattered around on the floor, but no pants. The pants were nowhere to be found, which was odd, since Lance was a very clean and organized man. In the area where Lance stored his tools on pegboards, Investigators noticed that each tool was traced so that when it was gone, there was an outline left, showing Lance where it should go. There was only one missing tool, a 16-inch adjustable crescent wrench. They searched for the wrench high and low, but couldn't find it. Investigators spoke with Lance's employees. A part-timer named Talana said that the night before, she worked in the office from around 6 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. After she arrived home, she talked to Lance on the phone until midnight, and she hadn't heard from him since. Speaking with Talana helped police develop a time frame for Lance's murder. Between midnight, when he spoke to her, and 4.10 a.m., the time frozen on one of the unplugged clocks. Thinking maybe Lance had been robbed, investigators asked Lance's employees to look around and see if anything was missing. They looked and found that a very expensive laptop of his was gone. The case was there, but the laptop was nowhere to be found. They said Lance would never have taken the laptop without its case. The employees asked if Lance had been found with the necklace he always wore, and investigators said no. When they asked if Lance's credit card was in his dresser, the answer was also no. Investigators now had a list of stolen items. 
and they asked employees if they knew who the woman in the overturned photo was. They said her name was Kathy. She had been with Lance on and off for years. She was his public girlfriend, the one he took on trips and to important events. They were very close. However, Lance was planning on ending his relationship with Kathy as well. Considering Kathy a possible suspect, investigators interviewed her, but she had an alibi. She had been at a funeral out of town. The next person detectives wanted to speak to was Lance's ex-wife, Janine. They were recently divorced due to his infidelity, and Janine was the beneficiary to Lance's $1 million life insurance policy, so she could be a good suspect. But she also had an airtight alibi. She had been out to dinner with her boyfriend. Investigators went back to Talana and asked if Lance had any other girlfriends. She said Lance had been dating a woman named Dion. Investigators looked into her and realized she was married. So they decided to look into her husband. Maybe he had found out about the affair and was not happy. When they dug in deeper, they found that Sean had been in Atlanta on the night of the murder, which was even more suspicious. Now they really wanted to talk to Sean and Dion, so they went to Dion's house. When they told her about Lance's death, she went into hysterics. After she calmed down, they asked Dion about her relationship with Lance. She said they were madly in love, but she told her husband he was just a mentor. Dion said she had no idea Lance planned to break up with her, or that he had other girlfriends. Dion asked, quote, Did he give them all a car? Did he give them all a credit card? When a man puts you on a pedestal and treats you like that, it's easy to think you're the only one. I guess I am stupid. Detectives asked Dion where she and Sean had been on the night of the murder. Dion said that Sean had been in town until she dropped him off at the airport at around 9 p.m. Then she said she went back home to study before Lance came by to drop off his laptop and credit card to her. Investigators weren't so sure about Dion's story. Talana said Lance had been home until at least midnight when they got off the phone, but they didn't have enough to charge Dion. So they verified that Sean had been on the plane and then moved on to their next task, which was trying to figure out what was used to murder Lance. The medical examiner concluded that the murder weapon was textured and had a curved and lined pattern to it. He said that Lance's injuries reminded him of a case he had worked on years before where a crescent wrench had been used. That was the same tool missing from Lance's pegboard. With that in mind, Investigators re-interviewed people, hoping they would know something about the wrench. A housekeeper told them the wrench had been in his bedroom on the night he was murdered. He had planned on putting together some exercise equipment, but hadn't gotten around to it yet. When investigators heard the murder weapon had been laying out in the open for someone to grab, they realized Lance's murder might not have been premeditated, that it could have been a crime of passion. Investigators purchased a wrench similar to the one that had been on his pegboard and took it to the medical examiner. After examining it, he was now certain the wrench could have been used to kill Lance. Now that they had the murder weapon established, investigators decided to re-interview Lance's employees to see what else they knew. One of them brought up the incident where Dion was arrested after trespassing at Lance's. This is the part in a story that often baffles me. Why wouldn't Lance's employees, especially Zanya, have remembered this incident sooner, especially since the court date was supposed to be the next day? And also, if detectives had felt that Dion's story was hinky the first time they talked to her, why had they not already circled back to his employees? Anyway... Obviously, now that they knew Lance was found dead on the day Dion was supposed to be in court, she was looking like their best suspect. And then they checked Lance's stolen credit card statements. And they found out she had used Lance's credit card to buy $3,000 worth of furniture on the day he was found dead. And now investigators finally, officially had their main suspect, Dion Bow. They brought her in for questioning again. She acted coy and flirted with them while repeating her story about Lance bringing the laptop and credit cards over to her, which police now knew for sure was a lie. 
They pressed her to give them a time, and she couldn't remember. Between 9 and 10.30 p.m., she said. Then she changed the subject by asking, Let me ask you this. I saw his ex-wife on TV. Now, what's the progress of this investigation? Have you spoken with her? Investigators had expected her to try and deflect the blame. They were prepared. After talking about Janine for a while, investigators asked Dion if Lance supported her financially. She admitted that Lance gave her cash or would transfer money through the bank. But then she quickly changed the subject in the most bizarre way. She asked about Lance's former attorney who had previously drawn up a will for Lance, but it was never completed. Dion said she only brought it up because she knew Lance had an oil painting he wanted to give to a friend who was gay. She found this strange because, quote, as much as Lance was trying to fight people accusing him of being gay, that he would leave such an elaborate painting to a gay friend. Investigators were intrigued by this weird turn and wanted to see what else she would come up with. They asked, were people saying that he was gay? And Dion replied that Lance's ex-wife had accused him of being gay. They asked if he was, and she said, quote, I don't think so. If he was, I wouldn't have been with him. Dion added that Janine accused him of being gay so many times that Lance told Dion, quote, anytime you think that the gay mannerisms are starting to show up or something, let me know. Dion said she never saw any. She went on to say Lance would be upset if the public knew his business, but since it was a murder investigation, she would tell them. She claimed Lance was molested from the ages of 9 to 12 by a man, and that he had difficulty dealing with it, and that's why he, quote, couldn't maintain a relationship because he always had urges to be with a man. Dion added that she had encouraged Lance to try out his urges, and she claimed he told her that's why he liked being with her, because he could be himself with her. The detectives asked Dion what kind of sex he liked, and she answered anal. He was obsessed with it, and that's why she encouraged him to be with a man. Investigators did not believe a word she was saying. They were eventually able to guide the conversation back to reality. They really wanted to know when Lance had stopped by her house to drop off the laptop and credit card, because they knew the laptop story was key to proving her guilt. But Dion couldn't remember. He had only been there for a few minutes before leaving, and they hadn't even slept together, she said. Investigators tried getting an answer out of Dion for hours, but she just wasn't budging. So one of them told her, quote, I'll tell you what I think. I think you went over there that night. I don't think he came to your house. I think you went over to his house on a pretext of returning the car to him, or for some reason you thought you could work things out with him. You go there to be together. There's something that ticks you off. I think you got mad that he wasn't coming to court. You hit him over the head several times because you just flipped out. Dion calmly told the detective that she didn't know Lance wasn't going to court. When they brought up how she had used Lance's stolen credit card to buy $3,000 worth of furniture the day he was found dead, she said they were wrong and asked if she needed an attorney. They said that was up to her, but she wasn't under arrest yet. However, they did have a search warrant that they would be executing on her car and house very soon. According to author Ron Stodgehill, for the first time that afternoon, Dion Bo looked worried. Police searched Dion's purse. Inside were dozens of silver foil gum wrappers, just like the ones found at the scene. There were also several documents she had drawn up. They were just waiting for Lance's signature. One document stated that the Mercedes had been purchased by Lance and in the event of his death, the title should be given to Dion. Another document was an agreement between Dion and Lance acknowledging the existence of their romantic relationship and stating the car would belong to Dion if they stayed in a relationship until July of 1998. Another document was Lance's purported summary of the circumstances of the criminal trespass case and his desire to have the charges dropped. Also in Dion's possession was Lance's credit card and the $3,500 laptop. The laptop was missing the carrying case that Lance insisted be used whenever it was borrowed. Police also found that Dion had stolen some of Lance's jewelry, 
including the necklace his employees said he always wore. What they did not find was the murder weapon or Lance's pants. After searching Dion's things, DNA evidence found at the murder scene was tested against Dion. While there were no fingerprints found in Lance's bedroom, there was some DNA found under his fingernails. It belonged to both Lance and Dion. Two of Dion's head hairs were found on Lance's body. One of her pubic hairs was on his chest. This most likely came from her straddling him. They also found Dion's saliva on Lance's penis, meaning she had probably performed oral sex on him prior to his death. All of this DNA evidence was a big win for the prosecution, but it wasn't a slam dunk by any means. Dion and Lance were in an intimate relationship, so it only made sense that her DNA would be found on him. However, Lance was a meticulously clean man. He took power naps lying on his back with his arms folded over his chest to avoid wrinkles. He ate barbecue ribs with a knife and fork. He showered every day and saw a barber and manicurist weekly. There was no way Lance had Dion's DNA on his body from a sexual encounter days prior to his death. They must have slept together the day he died, which meant Dion had lied to them about what she was doing the night of August 7th. They now had quite a bit of evidence against Dion. However, authorities recognized there was nothing putting her at the scene, no fingerprints or eyewitnesses. All they had was a lot of circumstantial evidence. Yes, DNA is still circumstantial. It was too risky to take her to trial, so the case went stale. As the months passed with no new evidence, Lance's loved ones began to worry his killer would never be held accountable. Then in January 1998, Sean went to the police to make a statement. He told them that months earlier, while Dion was in Jamaica visiting, he asked her if she had anything to do with Lance's murder. Dion immediately turned violent. She was cursing, kicking, and beating him. Then she threatened to kill him, just like she did Lance. Following that incident, Sean said he wanted a divorce. Dion became jealous and accused him of dating someone else. She hit him across the face and grabbed his genitals so hard he had to pry her fingers off. Later, she went into his room and destroyed his travel documents so he would have a difficult time going through immigration. Sean told investigators that for the entire month of December, he was afraid of her. Obviously, this statement was big for the police. Sean said they had a divorce hearing coming up where the topic of discussion was whether or not Dion had an affair with Lance. Investigators decided to attend the hearing to see if Dion made any incriminating statements they could use against her. On January 28th, Dion, Sean, and the investigators all showed up for the divorce hearing. Just like expected, Dion accidentally incriminated herself in Lance's murder by giving a contradictory statement. She gave a sworn testimony that she was just friends with Lance, that they had never slept together. But she had told police they were madly in love. Then, in another shocking twist, Sean's mother testified that Dion told her she had gone to Lance's house on the night of August 7th to pick up the laptop. As we know, Dion told the police that Lance had dropped the laptop off at her house. Investigators could now place her at the scene of the crime. It was the final piece they needed to arrest her. On January 29th, the day after the divorce hearing, 29-year-old Dion was arrested outside of her house. She was charged with murder until a grand jury session could be held. On February 3rd, a grand jury indicted Dion on multiple charges. Malice murder, felony murder, aggravated assault, theft by taking a laptop, theft by taking jewelry, and financial transaction card fraud. She was released on a $150,000 bond. On April 9, 2001, 33-year-old Dion's trial began. The prosecution told the jury that Lance was an astute businessman and philanthropist who did have flaws, primarily two. He liked women, and he liked to spend money. They continued, quote, And it is within these two concepts, money and women, that he and the defendant were connected because, you see, Dion Bo liked to spend money, Lance's money. 
She received hundreds of dollars in cash a week, a Mercedes-Benz, a credit card, and so much more. And when Lentz threatened to take that away from her, she was driven to murder. Because Dion was so much more than a gold digger, she was also greedy and evil. The prosecution told the jury what they believed happened that night. Dion went over to Lance's place. After showering, Lance was sitting up in bed watching the porn tape in the VCR when Dion came into his bedroom. He did invite her into bed with him, but she was reluctant to do so because she was upset about going to court the next day for the trespassing incident. She was also upset with Lance for calling her and causing issues with Sean. Dion told Lance she was worried about the charge and he assured her that they would go together and explain that it was a misunderstanding. She didn't believe Lance, but decided to have sex with him anyway because she didn't want to lose him. After he fell asleep, she went downstairs to check his planner to see if he was going to court with her the next day, and found that he wasn't. And then she became angry. She went back to the bedroom, grabbed the wrench, and hovered over him. After a groggy Lance sat up to see what was going on, she hit the back of his head, causing him to fall onto the bed and then she straddled him and struck him again and again and again. When all of her rage was gone, she grabbed the pillowcase to wipe off, then put it in the toilet to get rid of evidence. She went back to Lance's body, stole his gold necklace, crossed his arms and pulled the sheet over him, and then jumped in the shower to clean the blood off of herself. When she was done, she went through Lance's dresser to get a credit card and unplugged his alarm clocks. She grabbed his pants off the ground and wiped everything down, removing all fingerprints. She picked up the wrench, wrapped it in his pants, then went down to the office. After stealing his laptop, Dion left through the garage, dropping her gum wrappers along the way. Prosecutor Clint Rucker later told Oxygen, quote, The consistent theme I pointed out to the jury is, when did Dion get the laptop? There was really one opportunity to do it, and that's when she came to the house at midnight. Dion's defense was all based on her statements to police. That Lance had dropped off the laptop to her before 10.30 p.m., and then she spent the night studying. The defense told the jury that Dion was, quote, targeted as a suspect probably 10 minutes after they found the body. But she had no reason to kill Lance, they said. He asked for the trespassing charges to be dropped, and they had reconciled. The defense told the jury that the prosecution's case was completely circumstantial. Any DNA evidence could be explained away because Dion and Lance were intimate. They slept together days before the murder. And furthermore, due to Lance's, quote, sex addiction, it could have just as easily been any one of his many women sitting here in court today because of having sex with Lance Herndon is the equivalent of being his murderess, well, let me tell you, the list would grow mighty long. On April 17th, after the jury deliberated for just over six hours, Dion was found guilty of malice murder, felony murder, aggravated assault, both of the theft charges and the financial transaction card fraud. Later, the jury spoke with the media. Their decision had boiled down to the fact that Dion was the only one with the motive and opportunity to kill Lance. The foreman added that the jury noticed when crime scene photos were shown, people in the courtroom turned away in horror. But Dion, who was two inches away from her attorney's laptop, was looking at the pictures, quote, it was like she was mesmerized by what she was seeing. On April 20th, Dion's sentencing hearing was held. But before proceedings could begin, the defense announced they found that the prosecutor, Clint Rucker, hadn't paid his bar dues. The judge asked Rucker what had happened, and he could not explain why. He must have forgotten. The judge admonished Rucker up and down, but in the end, chose to allow the verdict to stand because he was worried about double jeopardy. He said the Supreme Court of Georgia would have to decide the implications because they were far wiser than him. Rucker later told author Ron Stodgill that he, quote, cannot ever remember feeling as bad as I did after that, ever in my life. I felt really bad for the Herndon family, that they had to deal with what was clearly my own negligence. Rucker was demoted and received a pay cut. When proceedings finally began again, Lance's ex-wife Janine read a victim impact statement for the whole family. She talked about how Lance's mother Jackie felt like her life was over now because, quote, this is the worst of the worst that could happen. 
Nothing could be worse than finding your child like that. She says when she wakes in the morning, his face is the first thing that she sees, and it's the first thing she sees when she goes to bed. Janine continued, detailing how the 10-year-old son she shared with Lance, quote, misses him. He doesn't understand why this happened, and for a long time he would ask me why God would take his father. Dion Bowe was sentenced to life for murder, five years for theft, and two years for financial fraud. She never had to confess to her crimes. On July 10, 2003, the Supreme Court of Georgia overturned Dion's conviction and sentence and ordered a new trial, but it didn't have anything to do with Rucker not paying his dues. The court did not even address that issue. They only focused on one thing. During the trial, the prosecution had the lead investigating detective, William Anastasio, testify to the contents of out-of-court statements made to him by five witnesses, who had all been called by the prosecution and testified before the lead detective was called. After Anastasio recited what one witness said in her out-of-court statement, he was then asked what Dion had said on the same subject in her statements to police. The prosecution was attempting to demonstrate the inconsistency between Dion's statements and those made by various witnesses, but it was complete hearsay and never should have been allowed. The court felt that Anastasio's testimony was a harmful error and contributed to the guilty verdict. Because the prosecution's case was purely circumstantial and based on credibility, the improper bolstering of the prosecution's witnesses added critical weight to their case. This is on Clint Rucker and the judge. Lance's family had already had reservations about Rucker, who at the time was pretty green. This was one of the first cases where Rucker brought in his jar of dirt and river water and pulled his muddy waters routine in court, a strategy very familiar to anyone who follows his career. Rucker has used it in several cases, include Tex McIvers, which I covered where his antics, along with his booming fire and brimstone way of speaking, has now made him a successful, if sometimes controversial, Fulton County prosecutor. On October 28, 2003, Dion's retrial began. The prosecution and defense were basically the same as they were in the first trial. Now, after deliberating for 14 hours over the course of four days, the jury announced they were deadlocked. Instead of declaring a mistrial, the judge decided to excuse a juror that he felt was being sympathetic to the defense. The jury foreman had told the judge that the juror, Stacy Jackson, was overzealous and had asked a deputy when he could give interviews to the press. An investigator looked into Jackson and found that he was a volunteer in the district attorney's re-election campaign three years before, which he did not disclose on his jury questionnaire. In addition to working on the campaign, Jackson had tried to get a job from the DA, even though he didn't have the necessary college degree. The prosecutor said because of these things, Jackson had an axe to grind. On the fifth day of deliberations, an alternate juror took over Jackson's place and the jury started over. But after six and a half hours, they told the judge they were deadlocked again. On November 8th, a mistrial was declared, and it was expected that Dion would be charged for a third time. However, the judge said he didn't want to try the case again anytime soon, his reasoning being that Dion hadn't posted bail since the Supreme Court overruled her conviction, so she would likely sit in jail until her third trial. Which sounds totally fair, right? Anyway, Dion did end up posting bail. She was put on house arrest until her third trial. On September 27, 2004, the third trial began. But before jury selection could begin, Dion told the prosecution that she wanted to make a deal. In the end, she pled guilty to the reduced charge of voluntary manslaughter, a heat-of-the-moment killing. This was a good deal for the prosecution because their case was so circumstantial, and because Lance's mother, understandably, did not want to sit through another trial. Before she was sentenced, Dion was asked if she had anything she wanted to say, but she said no. She was sentenced to 10 years in prison, minus time served, and 10 years of probation. The judge told her she could remain on bond until October 5th when she would turn herself in to begin her sentence. On October 5th, Dion was an hour late to turn herself in, 
because she had been speaking and laughing with the excused juror from her second trial, Stacy Jackson, by an elevator in the courthouse. I completely understand the reason for the deal, but 10 years is very light for such a brutal murder. And I'm not sure I would buy a heat of passion defense considering the documents Dion had drawn up and taken over to Lance's on the evening she murdered him. Also, if it was heat of passion, why was she so jealous when her husband asked for a divorce? No, I think Dion became enraged that the gravy train was ending. And we have all heard the way that intent can be formed very quickly. She hit Lance in the head once, and then she made a choice to literally bash in his skull. It was horrifically brutal, and it takes a lot of willpower to murder a person in such a physical way. Less than seven years after her sentencing on July 28, 2011, Dion Bo was released from prison and began her 10-year probation sentence. It's unclear what she's been up to since, but some reports say she stayed in Georgia, while others say she's moved around. Either way, she has wisely stayed out of the spotlight. Lance Herndon was not a perfect man. In some ways, he fell victim to his own fortune and to the time period in Atlanta when he rose to success. Players played, and they also had to flex. It was a part of the culture. But also, who can blame a man who worked so hard and built so much all on his own for enjoying his wealth and status? He earned it. No matter how he spent his money or who he spent his personal time with, he did not deserve such a vicious death. A death that was felt so keenly by the black community of Atlanta. After Lance's death, his family set up the Lance Herndon Scholarship Fund for minority students. They also tried to keep Access Inc. going for as long as they could. Lance's mom, Jackie, even suggested that his ex-wife, Janine, lead the management team. Janine accepted the position, but Lance had fallen too far into debt to keep the company afloat. Today, Lance's legacy continues to live on through his son, Harrison, who started his first business at the age of 16. Harrison told Oxygen that he wants to be just like his dad. He wants to be as successful as he was and to have the life that he had. He believes his father's death is what drives him so hard. Harrison hopes his father looks down on him from heaven and is proud of all that he's become. I don't doubt that he is. I'm so glad Lance's son has such a positive outlook on life. And I hope that his mother and other loved ones finally found some peace, if not closure, which is almost always unattainable, especially when such a vibrant person is cut down in their prime. Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched and written by Haley Gray with additional writing by me. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. If you have any case suggestions, please visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com, and go to the Listener Suggestion tab. If you have submitted a case suggestion in the last few months, please resubmit it on the website. I was very overwhelmed by email when I came back from my sick leave, and I never got caught up. This is the best way for me to get to those little-known cases y'all always send me. And please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media private messaging. With three platforms to manage, this is also very overwhelming for me. I hope you understand. But please do come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. I much prefer spending my social media time in our lovely group. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern fraud, but all kinds. But it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit asses are allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on all large platforms like iHeart, Stitcher, and Spotify. Until next time. Thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.